tell me. not just in general, but to your own lives and the lives of the people that you know. Uh, one of the points that I often make is sometimes we forget that we live in the wealthiest country in the history of the world. That's where we live, but we forget about it because when we look out into our communities, we see a lot of people who are hurting, and in my view, hurting unnecessarily. Uh, we have too many seniors living in poverty. We have too many seniors struggling with the high cost of prescription drugs. We have too many seniors paying too much for housing or unable to afford to heat their homes in the winter time. We have too many seniors struggling with the high cost of health care and all of what that is about. But seniors not do not only worry about their own lives, they worry about their kids and they worry about their grandchildren. They worry about whether or not their children are gonna have as high a standard of living as they do. They wonder about whether their grandchildren are going to be able to afford to go to college. They worry about what climate change is doing to the planet and whether their grandchildren will live in a planet that is healthy and that is habitable. So there are a whole lot of issues to be talked about today. And I want to begin, and I'm going to chat in a few minutes, but I wanted to begin by introducing to you uh, folks who will say a few words who are very, very knowledgeable on senior issues. And we're delighted to have with us today Greg Marshallden, who, as you know, has been one of the leaders of the AARP here in the state of Vermont for many, many years. Rita Copeland, who's with the Twin Valley Senior Center, and Beth Stern, who's with the Central Vermont Council on Aging. So let me begin the discussion. What we'll do is hear from these guys. I'll say a few words, then we'll open it up to your questions and your comments. Does that sound all right? Okay. All right, let me begin with Greg. Greg, did you want to come up here or do you want to stay there? Why don't you come on up here, Greg? Uh, thank you, Senator Sanders. I, just a, a quick anecdote. I was on a phone call with a friend, an old college friend last night. He lives in Lincoln, Nebraska. And uh, he had just seen uh, a morning call poll which shows the most popular senator in the United States of America happens to be this gentleman standing right now. He asked me why I thought that was, his steadfast and strong support for Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, the Older Americans Act, 
fighting for Vermonters day in and day out? The answer is definitely yes to those questions. But maybe more importantly, it's this. Because Senator Sanders has shown up in community after community after community for older Vermonters now for decades. And he does what I think all of us expect our elected officials to do, which is come talk to the people that he represents. We're extremely fortunate to be able to have the kind of access that the center has let us have for many years. And he deserves a big round of applause. I just have two quick things um, so that we can get to questions. A couple of things AARP is working on, one in the state and one at the federal level. The first is here in the state. We're pushing hard. I think some of you may have made some phone calls and sent some emails for us. We're trying to cut Social Security taxes for people that are paying state taxes here in Vermont. We are only one of four states that do this. It's time for us not to do this anymore. Um, and um, there are a couple reasons why. About seven in 10 people over 65 on Social Security, that is their primary source of income. We are looking at about the 50,000 people that really live on the edges, where this money will really make a difference. It's not, we're not gonna be able to get everybody done right away, although AARP is gonna come back and try to finish the job over the next few years. But we wanna start this year by focusing on the low and low moderate income seniors who are really feeling the squeeze. As the Senator said, it's folks with high prescription drug costs, uh, high medical costs, uh, rent, mortgages, we need to provide some relief, and there is no reason why in the state of Vermont we should be taxing uh, senior citizen social security benefits. Not at all. If you have not contacted your legislators, some are here, I would encourage you to do so. Um, we think we have a very good opportunity to get this done this session. It's going to make a big difference, and then we'll come back and talk to you later as we try to get the full deal done for everybody. Secondly, um, uh, AARP state directors, and we'll all be in Washington, D.C. next week. I'll be meeting with the senator's staff on a, on a number of issues. Um, but one of the things I want to point to is the Older Americans Act, and my organizations and the senator's strong support for that over the years. We have senior senator folks in this panel who know this work uh, in more in more detail than I do because they live it every single day. Um, but our nutrition programs, Meals on Wheels, support for senior centers, Medicaid transportation, all of this stuff is in the balance. Now, you don't need to call Senator Sanders and remind him to support the Older Americans Act. He's the single strongest supporter of it in the United States Congress. But if you have friends in some neighboring states, uh, give them a call because we really need this program funded. We need it supported. The SNAP program, particularly these nutrition programs for low-income seniors, are a lifeblood. And if we can't have our direct service providers on the ground with the resources that they need to provide these services, particularly to old, older, and more isolated uh, senior citizens, we're going to be in real trouble. We are the second oldest state in the nation. That is not going to change in anybody's uh, lifetime in this room. So we need to start uh, doing a better job of supporting these programs and calling for increases in them. Thanks for having me today, Senator, and look forward to your questions. Thank you, Greg. Well, let me introduce Rita Copeland from Twin Valley Senior Center. Pretty hard for me to follow. I wanted to. Um, it's good. Calm down. Can you hear me better now? That was pretty hard to follow. You took all my ideas. And <laughs> I did want to point out, and I do want to thank Senator Sanders, Congressman Welch, and Senator Leahy for all they do in Washington for us. It's terrific. Being a senior center director, which I have been for the last eight, nine years, I have firsthand knowledge of what is out there, and it's not good. We do Meals on Wheels. We're a very small center located in East Montpelier. We cover six towns, Woodbury Palace, East Montpelier, Plainfield, Cabot, and Marshfield. 
We started with the program of the Meals on Wheels where we cook at the center. I have wonderful, dedicated volunteers that go out many weather and deliver these meals to the homebound seniors. While they're doing that, they are doing a well-being check on these seniors. The seniors sometimes don't have anybody they talk to day after day, so they really take and talk to their friendly drivers and throw them all off on course and try to get their meals out on time. But that's great. A couple of things. Um, the Meals on Wheels program is very hard to operate because we do not get the financial backing. We produce probably 200 meals a week to the homebound seniors, and we serve between 25 and 35 meals at the center three times a week. These are all home-cooked meals overseen by a registered dietitian. We get reimbursed for those meals from Central Vermont Council on Aging, who are federal, federal and state. Uh, $3, we just got a raise in seven years, four cents, 54 cents a meal. It cost us about $9.58 to produce those meals. And that does not include the volunteer drivers who we reimburse 50 and a half cents per mile. They use their own car, their own gas. So you can see there's a big discrepancy there. We do not refuse serving anybody that's qualified for Meals on Wheels because of their ability to donate towards the meals. And so therefore that makes it even harder to keep ahead. Um, we also have seniors who come, we do not charge dues, which is probably a little weird and you think, wonder why. We do not charge annual dues at our center. And the reason for that is people cannot afford it. You're there to help the seniors off of the programs, keep them healthy, make sure they get exercise. And so the people that come to the center cannot afford to pay dues and then pay for these classes. So therefore we reach out, do a lot of fundraising, and try to make up the difference. Of course our budget never, we're always short at the end of the annual year with our budget. But those are things that, um, that really hurt us trying to help everyone out there. In the six towns that we cover, I know I looked it up and from the 2010 census, I believe we have over a thousand, a thousand one nineteen, I believe it was, of people 62 and over. Um, there's no transportation in these rural towns. We do have a bus uh, that goes to pick seniors up, brings them to the center the ones that want to come and takes them home three times a week. And the isolation, the physical exercise um, out there, you know, it, it's hard for these homebound seniors. And so we're trying to do everything we can. I have a lot of outreach to do in these little towns, and I'm trying to do that, but again, I'm only one person that operates the center along with the volunteers. And there is some funding out there we need to hire assistance or get the help that we need. So I'm going to just say that, um, Bernie, keep going. Yeah. I would say, Rita, you keep going. <laughs> And Rita touched on some of the issues that I want to bring up later. The issue of isolation, yeah? There are a lot of seniors who have lost their long-term, lifelong spouses who are now struggling. There are, believe it or not, in the United States of America, as Rita just said, uh, elderly people who do not have enough food to eat, and Meals on Wheels is an extraordinary 
program, and what an embarrassment it is that in our state or in this country, there are waiting lines for people to get Meals on Wheels, which provides them often with the one nutritious meal they get in a day. That should not be going on in America. Uh, now let me introduce uh, Beth Stern, and Beth is with the Central Vermont Council on Aging. Beth? hard to follow all of these folks. Um, thank you for being here and I want to thank Senator Sanders for having this senior town meeting. What a great way to bring people together on what I'm hoping isn't going to be a snowy day later on. Um, could be. Um, Greg and I were talking earlier and it turns out we're both going to be on the same flight to Washington on Monday morning at six o'clock um, doing our thing going down there and advocating for um, services for older Vermonters and older adults in the U.S. and I also just want to reiterate that when I'm on a national board and when I go down there and I go meet with the staff or with the senators or our congressmen all the other people on the board of directors from around the country want to come with me because we have the most supportive congressional delegation in the country. It's really not hard work to go down there and talk to them about the Older Americans Act programs or services for seniors because they already get it and they're on our side. So, so we just want to thank them for that. Um, in the state of Vermont, we've really prioritized a system of aiming to help people stay in the setting of their choice. Most people want to stay home as they get older, and we're really working hard to make sure that that's possible. At Central Vermont Council on Aging, our services are designed to help just that. Through our staff and our partners, Rita being um, a prime example of our, our meal site partners, we offer all kinds of things, including um, the nutrition programs, granted not funded well enough, and Rita's absolutely right, we gave her a four cent raise after seven years. Um, part of that has to do with the sequestration cuts that we had several years ago. We have not um, bounced back from that yet. We also offer um, Welcome to Medicare classes, Tai Chi. I know that one of our Tai Chi volunteers is right here in front. Um, bone builders, powerful tools for caregivers, general information on all kinds of services and benefit programs. Um, for example, the Three Squares Vermont that Greg mentioned earlier, and, and actually there are some brochures out uh, on the table if you're interested in that. And also opportunities to volunteer or to be helped by volunteers. As Rita talked about isolation, one of the ways that people can um, get involved as they get older is to volunteer, and we know that that actually helps your health status if you're giving back to others. And so we have all kinds of volunteer opportunities, and also if you know people who need um, somebody to help them as a volunteer, we can help facilitate that. Uh, the challenges we face um, include uncertain funding at the state and federal level. We just uh, heard about the budget being passed at the federal level for this fiscal year, which started last October. So when you're running an agency and trying to pay your staff and your contractors and you don't know what your budget's going to be, it makes it really challenging to plan and be creative and be innovative. Um, Vermont, as we heard, has a growing population of older Vermonters. It's the fastest growing, growing demographic in the state. 23 Vermonters turn 65 every day. And this group is going to grow by more than 60% over the next 10 years. So just think about that. That's a lot of people. Another challenge we face is ageism. And, and that's the idea that people are limited by their age and that discrimination accompanies that. And that adds another layer to our already underfunded and overburdened system. So at our agency, we're working hard to reframe how we talk about aging and how we work with people who are aging and to truly look for opportunities rather than um, only focus on the negative issues. Uh, so our strength in Vermont is really our people, our staff, our volunteers, our community partners, our congressional delegation. Um, please utilize us. Call the senior helpline. I've got brochures in on the table in the back. Um, again, there's agency brochures. There's three squares brochures. There's even a little postcard about a fundraiser we're having on May 4th. So if you want to hear some really funny stories about aging, you can come to the Barry Opera House. 
<laughs> shameless plug. Um, but that's what we have to do. The senior center has to do fundraising, the area agencies have to do fundraising. We all have to piece together the funding to serve folks who need it. So um, I'll be here if people have questions afterwards. I really appreciate this and we'll turn it back to the senator. Thank you. Thank Greg and Rita and the Beth, not only for the, being here today, but for the great work they do. Let me take a few minutes to give you kind of an overview of what is going on in Washington, a perspective you're not going to see too often on television. <laughs> um, there is a very fundamental debate taking place in Washington right now regarding the future of this country. Um, and it is a debate which really does not reflect where the American people are. When you see a debate, you say, well, maybe half the people are here and half the people are there, and you know, there's a clash of ideas. That really is not what's going on. Because despite what you may see on television, on major issue after major issue, more or less, the American people kind of agree. But the dynamics of American politics today is that what goes on in Washington is not a reflection of what ordinary Americans want and believe. It is a reflection of what billionaires and wealthy campaign contributors want. <laughs> Give you some examples. In the last year, my Republican colleagues proposed a variety of legislation that would throw up to 32 million Americans off of the health insurance they currently have. Almost nobody in America thinks that that makes sense. Legislation, in and that legislation was defeated by one vote. What was not defeated, and when you hear Beth and Rita talk about the need for funding for nutrition programs or basic needs for seniors, keep in mind that a tax bill was recently passed a few months ago, which will drive up at the end of 10 years the deficit by $1.4 trillion, while giving 83% of the benefits to the top 1%. Now at a time when we already have massive income and wealth inequality, where if you can believe it, the three wealthiest people in America now own more wealth than the bottom half of the American people. Three Americans. Most Americans, the overwhelming majority of Americans, do not believe that we should be giving hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars in tax breaks to the top 1%. How did that come? And then, you see, then after that is done and the deficit goes up, and Paul Ryan, who is the Speaker of the House, who I think is beginning to catch on that that agenda is not what the people in Wisconsin or America want, has announced he's not running for re-election. That's right. Because this is the agenda and this is the plan. The plan is this comes from, anybody here who know who the Koch brothers are? Yeah. Right, the Koch brothers are the second wealthiest family in America. They're worth, I don't know, give or take a hundred billion dollars. Hard to keep up with them. What's a billion here or a billion there? And they have put, over the years, billions of dollars into the political process. And this is their theory. And you think I'm kidding you, I am not. Their theory is, their ideology is, what their belief is, is that government should play a very, very minuscule role in American society. And essentially, what they believe is not that we should cut Social Security and Medicare. A lot of people in Washington believe we should cut Social Security and Medicare. They believe we should eliminate Social Security and Medicare. What freedom, to their mind, is is the end of government programs. When you are on Medicare or Medicaid or Social Security, you are not free. They believe that we should eliminate public education, move toward charter schools. 
believe that we should privatize the Veterans Administration, the Postal Service. That is their philosophy. Forty years ago, that philosophy appeared to the American people to be crazy. Today, it is part of the mainstream of where Republicans are coming from. And those are the struggles that we have every single day. And it's manifested in the budget. And here's the bad news, but I'll give you the good news at the end of this. Bad news is President Trump brought forth the budget. And despite what he said in the campaign, which I know will shock you that he was not telling the truth. I know you're all shocked about that. But Trump said during his campaign he was not going to cut Medicare, Medicaid, or Social Security. In his budget, he brought forth a $1 trillion over 10 year cut to Medicaid. Now you know what that means? That's not just for lower income people. That's not just the Dr. Dinosaur program here in Vermont for the children. That is nursing home care. Who do you think pays for nursing home care in this country? Significantly, it is Medicaid. You have a trillion dollar cut in Medicaid. Families no longer able to take care of their parents, place them in decent nursing homes. What happens to those people who are dealing with Alzheimer's or other serious illnesses? What happens to the families? would have to figure out how they're going to take care of their parents. Trump proposed a $500 billion cut in Medicare. He proposed cuts in the Social Security Disability Fund. That's the bad news. The good news that we defeated every single one of those proposals. Now, in fact, what we did do, and uh, I, I wanted to mention, not only do you have great organizations here, and if you have any problems, contact them, but if you're running into problems on veterans issues, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, give my office a ring. We have great caseworkers uh, who often can help you. Give you an example, but my caseworkers, those are the people who answer the phone when Vermonters have problems. What they were telling me is that when people with disabilities, or seniors in general, were calling the social security offices, they did not get timely response. And the reason for that is that for the last eight years, the social security administration, the people who run the system, got no increases at all, and in fact, many positions were lost, so they're understaffed. I'm happy to tell you that in the last budget agreement, we managed to increase funding for the Social Security Administration for the first time in eight years to the tune of $480 million, something that I worked very hard on. <laughs> Terms of Life, which as you know is a very important program for our state and other cold weather states, Trump wanted to eliminate that program completely. So again, this is what goes on in Washington when you have a government that is dominated by big money interest. Tax breaks for billionaires, but we cannot afford a program which keeps millions of seniors and others warm in the wintertime. He wanted to eliminate that program. At the end of the day, we were able to increase funding for LIHEAP by $250 million. In terms of the Meals on Wheels program, uh, Trump and his friends wanted to cut those programs. Uh, we were able to stop that. In fact, uh, we were able to increase funding for Meals on Wheels by nearly $60 million. <laughs> now, truth is, for the nation, $60 million is not a whole lot of, of money, but we were able to prevent bad things from happening and make modest uh, improvements, long overdue improvements. All right. Now, in terms of the most important federal program passed in the modern history of this country, which is Social Security, uh, let me say a word about that. Again, in Washington, here is the lie. The lie is that Social Security is going broke, that we're going to have to cut benefits, that Medicare is going broke, Medicaid is going broke, we have a deficit, we're going to have to cut programs. The same exact people who go up on television and tell you this are the same exact people 
who have given over a trillion dollars in tax breaks to the wealthiest 1%. Now you tell me how we can have a trillion dollars in tax breaks for the 1% and we don't have enough money to fund the Meals on Wheels program or Medicaid or Medicare. That does not make sense to me. Now when they tell you that Social Security is going broke, understand that today Social Security has a $2.8 trillion surplus and can pay out every benefit owed to every eligible American for the next 16 years. Social Security is not going broke. But from a federal perspective, 16 years is not a terribly long time, and you want to be addressing that problem today. And that is why I have introduced legislation, which is very popular, makes a lot of sense to a lot of people. And that says that in terms of Social Security taxation, if we lift the cap, on taxable income for people making $250,000 or more, we can expand, extend Social Security for the next 60 years and increase benefits for lower income seniors. You know, a great nation in my view, and I think history will confirm this, a great nation is not judged by how many tax breaks it gives to billionaires or how many nuclear weapons it has. In fact, a great nation is judged by its compassion, by how it addresses the problems facing the most vulnerable people in its society. And the most vulnerable people are the elderly, people who are no longer able to go out and work, People often are dealing with one or another disability or illness, or how we deal with our children. And in fact, in both respects, taking care of the elderly and taking care of the children, we are not doing a good job. Now, there's another issue that is out there that I hope we will discuss further if any of you will have any questions on is the cost of prescription drugs. All right? Now, I deal with a lot of ugly people in Washington, <laughs> as you can get. People, you know, it, it, it is so funny, the difference between coming home to Vermont and being in Washington. You're in Washington, you got billionaires out there, people who are worth tens of billions of dollars. Koch brothers are worth a hundred billion dollars. You might think that if you were worth a hundred billion dollars, you would not be spending half your life trying to get more tax breaks. You might think that 100 billion would be enough to get you by, right? <laughs> you would think, <clears throat> if you had any sense of decency, when you're worth 100 billion or 50 billion, whatever these guys are worth, that you would not want to be cutting programs for people with disabilities or for the elderly, or for the children, or for the poor. That is what you might think. But that is not what goes on. And when you look at some of the awful people in Washington, there's no group, maybe with the exception of Wall Street, that ranks higher on the list than the drug companies. So let's be clear about what's going on with the pharmaceutical industry. Last year, the largest five drug companies in this country made $50 billion in profit. $50 billion in profit. They pay out huge compensation packages to the CEOs of these companies. They make tens of millions of dollars a year in compensation. But meanwhile, one out of every five Americans cannot afford to fill the prescriptions given them by their doctors. I remember talking a few years ago to a doctor in Underhill, and she was saying that about one quarter of the prescriptions she writes, the working class people, are unable to be filled. Now just think about how crazy that is. What is the sense of going to a doctor when the doctor makes a diagnosis, writes out a prescription, you can't afford to fill that prescription? Right now the situation is so bad, and the pharmaceutical industry is so powerful that over the years, Congress uniquely in the world, in the industrialized world, 
has not been able to pass one piece of legislation to control the drug companies and the prices that they charge. The truth is that today, you can leave here, go to your pharmacist, and try to get a prescription filled, and the pharmacist will say, well, I'm sorry, the price of that medicine has gone up double, or triple. And in fact, what we have seen is that since 2014, the cost of 60 drugs commonly taken by older Americans has more than doubled and 20 of them have at least quadrupled the price. And the reason is drug companies can charge any price they want. There is no control over them. Now these guys are incredibly powerful. Over the past 20 years, listen to this, drug companies have spent more than three and a half billion dollars on lobbying and hundreds of millions in campaign contributions. Got that? Three and a half billion dollars in lobbying. That means that virtually every member of Congress, not me, but almost everybody else, has received money from the pharmaceutical industry. I'll give you an example. I was out in California last year, and out in California they, they have something that we don't have. You can put statewide ballot initiatives out there, referendum. And what they said is they wanted the state government not to be paying more for prescription drugs than does the Veterans Administration, which negotiates prices with the drug companies. Do you know how much money, who wants to guess how much money the pharmaceutical industry spent in California to defeat that initiative? Answer, $130 million. In one state, on one initiative. In other words, these guys literally have endless amounts of money. Any state, I know in Vermont there is some effort here to do something which I think is important. All right, so what are the issues? Issue number one, drug companies can charge any price that they want. Millions of Americans are getting sick, in some cases dying because they can't afford to buy the medicine they need. That's issue number one. Issue number two, we pay by far the highest prices in the world for the same exact medicine sold in other countries. Some of you may remember a number of years ago, I became the first, was the first member of Congress, that was when I was in the House, not in the Senate, to take people, people who were up from Franklin County actually, over the border in Canada, we went up to Montreal to buy breast cancer drugs. And I'll never forget that. And this is what happened. We had a couple of buses going from St. Albans to Montreal, and these were women, working class women, who were struggling with breast cancer. They were fighting for their lives. We went up to Montreal, we had planned this all out, but it was just something to see with your own eyes. Women walking into the druggist there, they bought tamoxifen. Tamoxifen was then a widely prescribed breast cancer drug, and they paid 10% of the price they were paying in Vermont. One tenth of the price for the same exact medicine in the same exact bottle made by the same exact company. And by the way, Canada has the second highest prices in the world for prescription drugs. <laughs> in Europe, the prices are much, much less. So out of that trip, other members of Congress and the Senate did it. And the truth is that today, millions of people are now, through the internet or going across the border, buying less expensive medicine uh, in Canada. So there are several approaches that we are working on to try to take on the pharmaceutical industry. Number one, I am not a great believer in unfettered free trade. That's another discussion, but that is what exists. So if the food that you eat, if the clothing that you wear comes from all over the world, why cannot pharmacists or prescription drug distributors be able to purchase significantly lower cost prescription drugs from Canada or from Europe if they are FDA approved? All right, that will substantially lower the cost of prescription drugs in this country. Now, we've been trying to do this for a number of years, actually. There's some bipartisan support on that effort. There's some Republicans who support it. Pharmaceutical industry has spent hundreds of millions of dollars lying about this effort and trying to stop it. All right, we're going to continue to do that. And I understand here in our legislature there's some discussion of doing the same right here in Vermont, which is a very good idea, okay? Issue number two, and this is how crazy it is. Medicaid pays a certain price for prescription drugs. The Veterans Administration pays a different price, and Medicare pays a different price. <clears throat> Makes no sense whatsoever. 
So what we want to see is Medicare would spend zillions of dollars on prescription drugs, be able to negotiate with the pharmaceutical industry the price of those drugs. So when you go in, spending billions of dollars, you sit down and you say, you know what, Canada, they charge this, in Australia, they charge that, in France, they charge that, you're not gonna double the price. We're gonna negotiate what a price is. And if we do that, we will substantially lower the price of prescription drugs. So there are a number of things that have to be done, but the high cost of prescription drugs is one of the great healthcare crises uh, we face in this country today, and something we will continue uh, to work very, very hard on. Okay, uh, we're gonna open it up to questions. I also want people to talk about not just economic issues, but talk about what you are seeing in one of the problems that we face, and maybe the panelists can say a word on this as well, is when people get isolated, they turn to alcohol. And surprisingly enough for older people, for many older people, alcohol is a problem, uh, and other types of addiction. Uh, so let's talk about where we are as a state, where we are as a nation, uh, and where we want to be going in the future. So thank you all very much for being here. Let's open it up for questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, how are we doing with a mic? Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, Katarina has a mic. Uh, how many mics do we have, Katarina? Just one? All right, so she's going to be running around the room. Okay. Yeah, we're going to start it where you want. Uh, thank you. My name is Terry King. I'm from uh, West Thompson. Question about all these big things happening in the world and what their impact is on us here in Vermont. Um, I'm 78. My wife and I run a small business over in Thompson. We make uh, educational electronic kits that we sell to schools and universities like UVM, UConn, places like that. Um, in the summertime, we make a couple thousand kits in our barn, and our grandchildren help us, help us out. So, all of a sudden, we're hearing these scary words about tariffs. Um, our friend and partner in China ships us most of the electronics parts that go in these kits from China. How do we find out what the impact may be on our little business with the things we're hearing going on in Washington? Well, you're hearing a lot. We haven't seen anything definitive. The devil will be in the details. Okay, and we can help you, and we can get access to any tariff legislation that is passed. You can give us a ring. Right now, you're hearing general statements, but let me say a word on that. Okay, uh, I do not believe in unfettered free trade. All right, why not? Because what has happened over the last 30, 40 years is large multinational corporations have said to American workers in Vermont, some of you, anyone here from Springfield, Vermont, remember Springfield? Used to be a major manufacturing uh, town. What corporations have said to American workers, if you do not take a decline in your wages or your health care benefits, we're gonna move to China, we're gonna move to Mexico. The result is that the last 20 years we have lost 60,000 factories in America and millions of decent paying jobs. So I do not believe that American workers should be forced to compete against people in Vietnam, for example, where the minimum wage is about 70 cents an hour. On the other hand, I do believe in trade. I believe in fair trade, in fair trade. And sometimes the trade agreements that we have had have not been fair. So right now there's been a lot of talk from Trump about tariffs. To the best of my knowledge, there is very little specificity uh, and in terms of implementation, I think that has been zero implementation. Give us a ring and we will get into the details of that deal. Okay. Thank you. Um, hi, my name's uh, Victoria Rodine. I live here in Montpelier. Um, I have a bunch of eye conditions, including glaucoma. I've lost a lot of eyesight in one of my eyes, and my um, eye doctor said basically use the eye drops or you're going to go blind in that eye. So I went to refill my prescription. It normally costs maybe four or five dollars for the copay. Um, and they said we can't refill the prescription because the factory in Puerto Rico that produces this medicine was demolished in the flood and so we can't get our hands in the medicine. This is what they said at the local pharmacy. And I said, that's fine, I've got relatives everywhere, just let me know. And they said, no, you can't get it anywhere, certainly anywhere within the region, let alone, you know, maybe not even in the continental United States. They said, call your doctor, 
get him to prescribe something else that will do the same job. So I called, and they said, well, we don't want to prescribe this other medicine because it's kind of pricey, quote unquote. And I said, well, you know, i got to use it. My husband and I are both working. We'll do whatever we need to do. So I go to pick it up. $116 for the copay. And we have decent health For the copay. For the copay, which is to say that um, the, I don't know what the, I can't remember now what the actual cost of the medicine was. So I called the insurance company and explained the situation. They said, if you had been in the flood in Puerto Rico, that would be one matter. Then we could put it in the preferred list and we could give you a discount. However, since it's the factory that was demolished, there's nothing we can do. Um, you're just going to have to pay $116 for the copay. At that point, I said, I have to do that. I have to be able to see. Um, however, my next phone call is going to be to Bernie Sanders. <laughs> <laughs> um, and shortly after that, the call was dropped. But um, Beth encouraged me to raise this with you today because it's not just an individual, but a systemic issue. Did you get resolution of your problem? No, no, no. I know. I, I paid. I get, I paid $116. Right. Do me a favor. Leave your name and your phone number for Catalina. Okay. Yeah. Let's see what we can do about that. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Okay. That. Okay. Uh, Ma'am, right here. Uh, tell me your name. That beautiful t-shirt on. <laughs> yes. Very fashionable. Uh, very fashionable. Um, my name is Eileen Levitt. I live in East Montpelier. I'd like to hear your opinion about the prospect of impeachment of Donald Trump on the way as possible. What the strategy is going to be, and then the trial once he's impeached. <laughs> um, impeachment is, needless to say, um, a very, very serious um, process, uh, which takes place for high crimes and misdemeanors. Uh, as everybody in this room knows, there is right now an intensive investigation uh, done by um, uh, Mr. Mueller, who is now examining uh, starting off with the question of whether or not the Trump uh, campaign colluded with the Russians. Uh, and he is in the midst of a very, very extensive investigation. It would be premature as somebody who, if there was an impeachment process which starts in the House, would be a judge to make a, a statement on that. But let me say this. There has been discussion uh, in the media about the possibility of Trump firing Rod Rosenstein or uh, Mullick himself. Uh, from where I can see right now, that would be a significant obstruction of justice. So in other words, what I'm telling you is the process, before you ask me a question, you know, I, I think all of you know uh, that there is probably nobody in the Congress who feels more strongly about the terrible, terrible things that Trump has done as president. That is a different issue than impeachment. Uh, if Trump obstructs justice by ending the investigation of him, which talks about whether or not there were criminal activities, I believe that in itself is likely an impeachable offense. Okay? Okay. Senator, my name is John Murphy. I live in Barrie. I'd like to speak um, uh, in support of a Republican-inspired tax break called the Low Income Housing Tax Credit, and uh, to make sure that's protected. The median rent paid by uh, renters in Vermont is $871, and there are two plus a year waiting lists for people trying to get into um, subsidized housing. Uh, and I, thank you very much, Don, and I agree with you. Uh, and I believe we did have some success in the last budget uh, in expanding low-income housing tax credit. And the issue that you're touching on, the broader issue of affordable housing, uh, depending on where you live in the state of Vermont, I can tell you that in Burlington it is a very significant issue. And it is, that's true all over this country. So I am a strong supporter of low-income housing tax credit. Uh, good morning, Bernie. Uh, my name is Art Edelstein, uh, Cowles, Vermont, uh, Brooklyn, New York, James Madison High School. <laughs> <laughs> so my question is this. Um, all the, whatever the Democrats did uh, under the budget agreement that kept programs such as LIHEAP, I assume also 
in essence, raise the debt. So my question is this, um, can we rewrite the tax code when de Democrats take over Congress in 2019? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in my view, for a start, the Democrats should repeal all of the tax breaks for the wealthy and large corporations that were incorporated in the Trump tax proposal. <laughs> This is not complicated stuff. It comes back to massive levels of income and wealth inequality. Over the last 30, 40 years, the people on the top have done very, very well, while the middle class has been shrinking and we've got 40 million people living in poverty. So it seems to me what Congress's job should be is to pay attention to the needs of working families, the elderly, and the children. That's what we're talking about today. I mean, again, this is America. Should Rita or anybody else have to worry about funding a Meals on Wheels program? Don't tell me that in America we can't fund that and then say, oh yes, we can give tax breaks to the Koch brothers and other billionaires. So we got to get our priorities right. And our priorities are to simply say, not in a confiscatory way, but in a fair way, if you are making billions of dollars a year, you're going to have to start paying your fair share of taxes. If you are a large multinational corporation, you can't stash all of your profits in the Cayman Islands and in other tax havens and not end up paying a nickel in federal taxes in a given year, which is what now exists. So a fair tax system says that if you're a profitable corporation, if you're very wealthy, you will pay your fair share. We'll use that money to make sure that everybody in this country has at least a minimum and decent standard of living. Not more complicated than that to my answer. Hi, Bernie. Uh, I'm Mary Alice Fisty, a seventh generation Vermonter, not from Brooklyn. <laughs> to the right guy, because I introduced that legislation. Um, and here is, again, a point that I want to keep reiterating, in that when we think about politics, it's thinking about national priorities, when you give tax breaks to billionaires and not have enough funding for the Meals at Wheels program, but it's also looking around the rest of the world and asking, what are other countries doing? So it turns out, as I know Mary Alice knows, and maybe all of you know, that we are the only major country on earth, the only one, not to guarantee health care to all people as a right, as a right. Now, uh, many years ago in the 60s, under President Johnson, uh, Medicare and Medicaid were passed. Right now, Medicare is the most popular health insurance program in the country. It has its problems, which we want to improve upon, and I'll say about, I'll talk about that in a second, but it is very, very popular. My view is we should expand Medicare to everybody, which is what a Medicare for all single-payer program is about. Now, when I ran for president, people said, Bernie, that is a crazy idea. Oh, we can't do that. It's too radical. It's too this. It's too that. Well, guess what? 
In the last couple of months, there have been a number of polls that have come out. One poll has 59% of the American people supporting Medicare for All. Washington Post poll the other day has 51% supporting Medicare for All. Three years ago, when I introduced that legislation in the Senate, it had zero co-sponsors. This time it had 16 co-sponsors. And this time, all over the country, you're seeing candidates for the House and the Senate running and saying, of course, health care is a right. Of course, I support Medicare for all. So we are making enormous progress uh, on that issue of joining the rest of the world. Here's the other issue that Mary Alice also knows that we have to ask ourselves. How does it happen that we end up spending almost twice as much per person on health care as do the people of any other country. And the answer is that every other country understands that the function of health care is to provide it to all people in a cost-effective way to control the prices of drug companies. In our country, health care is significantly determined and directed by the insurance companies. And in case you don't know it, let me break the bad news to you. Insurance companies are not worried about quality, cost-effective health care. They are worried about making as much money as they possibly can. So, in my view, and we are making real progress on that, we've got to join every other major country on Earth, we've got to control the price of prescription drugs, and we need to move toward Medicare for all. Now, let me pick up on another point. Medicare is a very good program, but it has major faults. Major lackeys. What are they? Does Medicare cover dental care? No. 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 Our legislation covers dental care and dentures and so forth. Does Medicare cover the cost of eyeglasses and optical problems? No. Our legislation does that as well. So what we want to do is improve Medicare and guarantee it to all people. And at the end of the day, that will be less expensive per person than the current system. Now, what happens there is you will see 30-second ads all over the country, maybe in Vermont, saying, Sanders wants to raise your taxes. Terrible guy. <laughs> what they will forget to tell you, if you are a business person or just a plain citizen, you're no longer going to have to pay for pay your premiums to an insurance companies, and you won't have any deductibles or copayments. all right? So this effort of Medicare for All is gaining a lot of support around the country. It will be vigorously opposed by the drug companies and the insurance companies. All right, in my view, the second point you raise, moving forward for a universal primary care is an excellent idea, but let these guys say what they'd like on it. Anyone want to comment on that? We'll take, we, we, we've taken a look at this, but we think it's a good bill. We think there's a number of ways to get to what the Senator talked about, and I think Mary Alice, what you're talking about as well. We'll see what the Senate does. We've been very focused on, I mean, excuse me, in the House. We've been very focused on the Social Security bill, um, and that's been our primary focus this session. Um, but the association's point of view on this broadly is that everybody in the country needs affordable health care. It's just a very simple prospect. And a universal primary care bill is one way to take that step forward. A Medicare for all bill is something that delivers that in spades. I think the thing that when ARP, you know, as Beth said earlier, it's, it's not, it's easier for me up here than it is for a lot of my colleagues who are working in Alabama and Texas and other parts of the country because these conversations are not happening about universal primary care, about lowering the cost of prescription drugs. So, you know, to hear that we now we have 16 co-sponsors on the Senator's Medicare for All bill, uh, up from, I think you just said zero a few years ago, um, but the, the polarization is a problem. So until we can bring more folks over to the conversation that we can have in Vermont, right? We need to do that, you know. Uh, yes, no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, not arguing that. But I'm saying from a national perspective, it is, a very polarized environment. And, you know, there, and, and just, and 
we do a lot of good things here. But it's also not really, it's also a bit of fiction to say that whatever we do in Vermont, everybody else is going to follow because that just has not been the truth. No. Okay, let me move on to other questions. Yeah. I'll try. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Bernie Sanders. Um, my name is Jeff Lindemore. I live in Stowe. I just really found out tonight, today, this morning, that in a couple of weeks I'll be one of 23 Vermonters turning 65. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought I had a unique birthday. Um, the first thing I'd like to do is I'd like to ask you to extend our thanks and appreciation to your uh, congressman, uh, the con uh, Leahy and Welch, because they also work hard and I want to extend a thank you to them for everything that they do as well as what you do. My question gets back to the um, more political. Uh, just about every day, we re I read something uh, where Moa says, be patient. And a lot of people say, be patient, uh, which, is, which I'm willing to do. My question is, for our patience, will we be able to undo the damage that is being done every day by Trump? Well, you're, you're asking, Judge, you're asking two separate questions. Um, what Mueller is investigating is not Trump's effort to throw 30 million people off of health insurance, uh, not his effort to cut back on programs that working people desperately need, uh, not his expanding military spending by $165 billion over two years period of giving tax breaks to the rich. That's my job, that's not Mueller's job, that's all of our jobs. Those are political decisions being pushed not only by Trump, but by right-wing extremists who run the House and the Senate. What Mueller is looking at is a very simple issue. It is against the law uh, if somebody runs for president uh, and they get help from a foreign country, uh, it happens to, be, happens to be against the law. And what uh, Mueller is starting, is investigating, in fact, is whether or not Russia uh, collaborated with the Trump administration in terms of this campaign. That is the narrow issue, but enormously important issue that he is looking at. And that, he is moving along quickly. I cannot tell you, nobody can tell you when that investigation will end. But that is a separate issue of the disastrous economic health care policies uh, that Trump has proposed. Separate issues. Okay, uh, Katarina, yeah. Hi, my name is Susan Van Hilt, and I'm from Montpelier. Recently in the paper, I read an op-ed by you that said that you were supporting legislation to increase Social Security by $1,300 a year. Yeah. I would love you to talk a little bit more about that, and would it only apply to person receiving Social Security at a certain amount, and what are your ideas about that? Okay, uh, what that legislation is about is, as I kind of touched on a moment ago, uh, what you see on television every night uh, from people like Paul Ryan uh, is that uh, we have a large deficit and we have got to cut Social Security. So the point that I made a moment ago is that, in fact, we have a $2.8 trillion surplus, but, and that Social Security will be uh, fiscally uh, viable for the next 16 years, paying out all benefits. I want to see it viable for a lot longer period of time than that. So the way you do that is very simple. Right now, uh, if you make, uh, I think the number is about 123000 a year, you end up paying the same amount in Social Security taxes as somebody makes $10 million a year. You with me? If you lift that cap and you say that we're going to tax somebody who makes $10 million on $10 million and not $123,000, if you do that, we will bring in enough revenue to keep Social Security uh, viable for 60 years, 60 rather than 16. Also, we will be able to expand ex, expand benefits for lower income uh, senior citizens. And I can get you more details about it. It would not be for everybody. It would be for lower income people who are trying to make it on $12,000, $13,000, $14,000 a year. Now the other thing 
that we are doing is the following. Uh, your COLAs, if you're on Social Security, you know that your COLAs have not been all that great for the last many years, correct? Okay. Now, why is that? Anybody know why that's so? Yes. Susan, do you know why that's so in, in terms of COLAs? Change uh, All right. It, it is. All right. So, theoretically, what a COLA is is a cost of living adjustment. The theory is that if inflation goes up 3%, you should get a 3% increase in your Social Security check, right? That's the theory. How do, how does the government now determine uh, that uh, rate of inflation for seniors? The truth is, it is a very unfair methodology. Because seniors are lumped into the same group as the general population. So what does that mean? Are most seniors uh, worried about buying a flat screen television or the latest computer? The answer is no. Flat screen TVs have gone down in cost. A lot of electronic equipment has gone down in cost. So that suggests that inflation is not a serious problem. On the other hand, what are seniors concerned about? What do they spend their money on? They spend it on health care. They spend it on prescription drugs. Has the cost of prescription drugs gone up? You bet it has. So what we are trying to do is to come up with an approach which segregates what seniors spend money on. And if the cost of health care and prescription drugs is going up, that will be reflected in the new formula. Okay? Yeah. Hi, everybody. Bill April from Waterbury Center. And I have a question about the privatization. If, if uh, how that's going to affect Social Security. We've seen how the Postal Department got privatized, but they had a product to sell. They sell stuff that we, we mail. And they still have to come back every couple of years or so and ask for more money. Even though they have a rate increase of mailing, they still have to come back and ask Congress for more money. So how in the world are they going to privatize Social Security They've got nothing to sell except our investments. Right. What that's about, and by the way, the Postal Service issue is more complicated than that. You'd be surprised to know that since 2014, the Postal Service actually has made several billion dollars in operating profits. They are stuck with a particular burden that the Bush administration put on them, where they have to fund their health care and pensions for the next 75 years, something that no other private sector company or government agency has to do. Look. You have a group of people led by the Koch brothers, as we said earlier. They want to privatize virtually everything, including public education. This is what their theory is. Their theory is the government should not be involved in retirement security, i.e. Social Security. And that means, if you elim let's think for a moment, if you eliminated Social Security, what your freedom would be to invest in your life in the stock market or on Wall Street or any other way you wanted to do it. Now, sometimes people who do that make money. Uh, sometimes people rip them off because there are a whole lot of fees associated with it. Sometimes you have crashes, as we saw in 2008, which wiped out the life savings of millions and millions of people. All right? So they want to, from a, an ideological point of view, they want insurance companies and Wall Street to be the providers of retirement benefits to the American people. I think that that is an irresponsible and disastrous idea, and the American people believe that also. So our goal is to extend the lifetime of Social Security. Our goal is to improve the benefits over the years, starting with lowering the people and moving them up. But the point of Social Security, and here is the most important point. Think about it. You know, sometimes we take things for granted. Just think about it. How many times in our lifetime has any American received a letter from the Social Security Administration saying, uh, Dear Bill, uh, sorry to inform you that this month, because of economic conditions, your benefits have been cut by 50%. Truth is, no American in the history of Social Security has ever received that letter. The truth is that every, now we take it for granted, every American since the creation of Social Security has received every nickel he or she was entitled to receive. Now, we can argue benefits are too low. That's fine. 
But nobody has ever been told, sorry, you expected X, but you're only going to get Y. That's the strength of Social Security. Okay? Now, right now, one of the tragedies that we're dealing with in Washington is people were promised, often in the Midwest, more than the East Coast, promised pensions by their employers. And as a, as a result of a decision by Congress several years ago, people who had worked their whole lives, people who had given up wage increases, often unionized workers, suddenly found that the pensions that they had been promised were cut by 50, 25 percent, or whatever. Now think about living your whole life with the expectation that when you retire, you're going to have X amount of dollars, and you're only going to have two-thirds of that. So what Social Security is about is stability, it is about security, it is saying that you will get what you were promised. And that I will fight to make sure never let it stop. Yes. Hi, my name is Susie, I'm from um, Montpelier, and I want to thank you for coming. My question is, um, medical marijuana is legal in Vermont as of July 1st. However, because it is not legal federally, we can't have it in our level three um, assisted living homes. So our residents cannot benefit from the pain relief they could get. And I would like to know if there's something you can do to um, help us out with the federal government to see the benefit. Um, the answer is yes. Let me tell you what I did. And I know that there are people who disagree on this issue, but. Uh, right now, as of this moment, under the controls, Federal Controlled Substance Act, which regulates this stuff, uh, marijuana is considered the equivalent of heroin. Everybody in this room knows that heroin is a horrible drug which kills people and addicts people. Now, you can argue about the pluses and minuses of marijuana, but marijuana does not do that. And there are studies. And a lot of veterans, by the way, who often deal with pain-related problems have looked to marijuana as, as a, a source of pain relief. Uh, my view was uh, that, and is, uh, that this is a, that we should end the absurdity of marijuana being treated like heroin. It should be not on level one of the Controlled Substance Act. That decision should be made by the states. So uh, in Vermont, we have moved forward. And by the way, that's a significant step forward over a short period of time, and a number of other states have done the same. But to your point, I mean, I, I can't tell you that I know a lot about that particular issue, but I should think that if Vermont has decriminalized uh, marijuana, if it has legalized marijuana, it should be available uh, to all people who would like to uh, use it for pain relief. Yeah. Hi, Mr. Bernie. Hi. Um, yesterday morning I called your office. Um, I couldn't find the number in the Montpelier book. Joanne Dibble. Um, I was concerned about your vote um, about Mr. Papagallo. Perhaps that's not the question. Papagallo. Yes, and I, I really hope that, and almost know that you would vote against him yeah. for approval. Yeah. The State Department is well known. Well, we've made about three speeches on that subject. Yes, uh, you know, for a variety of reasons. Um, uh, Pompeo, uh, in his life, you know, there's a, what we call an international gag order where American uh, foreign aid is tied to programs that do not provide birth control or reproductive information to women, and I think that that is wrong, and he supports the continuation of that. His views on gay rights uh, are terrible. But most importantly, as Secretary of State, uh, I want uh, somebody to advise the president and to help implement in a very complicated and difficult world uh, to try to bring countries together uh, to work out through diplomacy uh, peaceful resolutions to the terrible conflicts that exist and not military solutions. And uh, I have no reason to believe that Pompeo agrees with that. So I will vote against Pompeo. We can only take a, a few more questions. We have to get up to Newport. Yeah. Uh, yes, my name is Alice Peel. I'm from Wakefield, Vermont. Um, 
you had asked about hearing about some people's experiences and what you see others having experiences with. In terms of insurance companies, Medicare, Medicaid, uh, Medicare Part D drug programs, I have rheumatoid arthritis. Twice a year I wind up in UVM Medical having um, IV medication for that. And I go in there and I sit with other people having infusions of drugs for rheumatoid arthritis and other things. Invariably, we all wind up talking about our headaches with private insurance, with Medicare, with the Part D drug coverage and approvals. And it's become very apparent to me, one, the stress that I've gone through throughout this journey with RA and dealing with insurance companies, coverage, deductibles, approvals. I see that depression and that stress every time I'm in there. I also see that because the drug companies do this and the problems with Medicare, more and more people, their treatment is being dictated by what would be covered or what is not covered. And if you kick it to Part D drug company, drug insurance, they'll pay half of your end bill. So your choice becomes, do you pay $2,000 a month out of pocket, or do you kick up to the next one, which is $25,000 a treatment four times a year. And that's what's happening. And that's what's costing us money and that stress of even doing it. My second question is about Social Security. You look on Facebook and you see all these wonderful memes about how that's our money. And it is our money. And I think AARP should be representing um, the elderly and Social Security and disability benefits in helping us protect that. And I specifically even considered, who do I go to to say, let's get a lawsuit against using our money or telling us we don't have our money anymore or misuse of our funds or these wacky Medicare um, it, it, negotiations. Okay, I mean, you've raised a, a lot of issues. <laughs> <laughs> well, but let me just deal with the first one first. Again, what I ask people, you know, sometimes the problems that we have is we get used to the world in which we live. Okay? And we step over people who are homeless. We see children sleeping out in cars. We understand that there are people who do not have enough food to eat. And we say, well, that's normal. It is not normal. Those are decisions made by a government which is dominated by greed, dominated by people who could care less about ordinary Americans who don't know, who don't care to know the kind of pain that exists in this country, who are simply hiring lobbyists all over Washington. Give me a tax break. I only made $14 billion last year, and if you do this, I can get an even bigger tax break. But don't tell me, you know, I'm from the drug companies. I don't want to be regulated. Deregulate. Let me do anything I want. That's freedom. You want to take away my freedom to double the price of your medicine? Oh, that's a terrible thing to do. So what we have got to do is to rethink things. Your point is a very good point. I have heard it a million times. Now, there was, I don't know if any of you saw this. Uh, a study came out. And these studies, you can you know, take them for whatever they're worth. They look at countries around the world who are happiest. You know, now what is happiness? That's a tough thing to determine. And what they usually find is that countries like Finland was this year, or Denmark, are the happiest. You know why? Because people in those countries do not have to deal with the incredible stress, stress that we have to deal with. In Finland, you know what? You get sick, you got all of the health care that you need. You don't have to worry about the cost of prescription drugs. You think that would not take away an enormous amount of stress from people? In Finland, kids go to college and graduate school tuition free. Hey, parents, do you think that would take a lot of stress away from all of us, what about the... So, you know, nobody has a magical solution to human happiness. But what we do know is if human beings can get the health care they need without worrying 
my God, especially when you're sick. You know, I was up in Canada a few months ago looking at their system again, and I talked to doctors and patients. And what the patient said, you know, I had cancer, whatever what the illness was, and I'm in the hospital. I got enough to worry about dealing with cancer. I don't have to worry about how I'm going to pay my bills or whether it's going to bankrupt my family or how I'm going to afford the medicine that I need. So when you get sick, you got enough to worry about trying to get well, not having to worry about the financial implications of your illness. In a democratic, civilized society, that is not an enormous ask. You know, we can do that. Other countries have already done that. And in terms of social security, look, this is a political struggle. It's a struggle between those people who simply want to make as much money as they can off of every aspect of human life. That's right. They want to make money off of the water. There are people around the right. country, corporations, who want to privatize the water that you drink. You know, pretty soon they'll probably be asking you to pay for the air you're breathing. You know, they don't stop. They do not stop making as much money as they possibly can on everything, including retirement, is their goal. But what I want all of you to know is that on those issues, and virtually every issue that I talked about today, the vast majority of the American people are opposed to those efforts at privatization, opposed to the efforts of the drug companies to be able to make more and more money, and they are moving in a direction which says that we need to have a government that understands the pain that people are feeling and develops solutions to those problems. Bottom line, again, let me end by the way I started. We are living in the wealthiest country in the history of the world. Problem is almost all of that wealth and almost all of the income generated every year goes to the people on top whose greed has no end. Yes, we can control the cost of prescription drugs, and in fact, we can do what other countries do and make prescription drugs available for free or very little cost to those people who don't have the money. This is not a radical idea. Yes, we can extend and expand Social Security benefits. Yes, we can guarantee health care to all and expand Medicare to cover dental issues and optical issues. Will those cost money? Yes, they will. But you do that by telling the billionaires and large corporations they're no longer going to get the tax breaks that they need, that we're not going to spend an endless amount of money on the military. So thank you. This is great meeting. I appreciate you all coming. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Tyler.